Yeah, I think we can start. Um, yeah, hello, good afternoon. Uh, Michael Wax and Ferry Heinemann from, uh, from FreightHub. Um, two of the co-founders uh, who built here digital freight forwarding company over the last two and a half years. Today we want to talk how uh, today technology is transforming one of the biggest markets uh, that we know, logistics. I want to start with a brief history of uh, container logistics and, and, uh, and, and how it all began, all the way up to how technology is now changing the entire industry landscape. Basically, it all started in 1955 when the first container was shipped, so 70 years ago. Um, and back then, the first ship was going from, uh, from New York to, to Texas uh, with about 60 containers back then. Yeah, and uh, uh, just a few years later, in 1980, um, almost 90% of all countries had a container terminal uh, opened. Yeah, so it really shows how quickly the entire uh, trend evolved. In 1970, about three to four million containers were shipped. Today, in 2018, we see more than 130 million containers that are being moved every single year. And by today, 90% of all goods that we see in this world are currently a container or have been in there. And this also, of course, had a tremendous impact on global economy. So if you look here at the, at the development of, of China's GDP, for example, it grew by over 200x over this time span. Yeah? Compared to the US, which saw about a 35% increase, this is really showing how much of the production actually was shifted to low-cost countries back then and how much it helped those economies to really grow strongly. And today, even, China's economy is growing at twice the speed of, of the US. Yeah? And we see this also in the venture capital space today, whereas this year, for the first time ever, China's investment in venture capital has uh, surpassed uh, uh, the American VC uh, investments. And more than 150 unicorns in this area also show the success rate of those companies. So I think that 10, 15 years from now, given those uh, developments, yeah, all being largely supported and, 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 and driven by containerization, by globalization in the end, uh, will show enormous effects on how we look at uh, today's uh, center of gravity in terms of tech, the Silicon Valley or San Francisco, compared to countries uh, like China and Shenzhen or Shanghai, where you even see uh, today already a, a, a way faster adoption when it comes to mobile trends, for example. At the same time, yeah, um, containerization and logistics has helped tremendously on, on, on significantly decreasing poverty in, in the world. Yeah? Uh, whereas in, in the 1980s, uh, almost 2 billion people were living be below the, the, the $1.90 that they see as a, like a minimum, um, uh, minimum wealth level uh, in order to be, be above the poverty uh, uh, barrier. Yeah? This decreased significantly over the last few years and mainly driven by the fact that the entire East Asia region has been seeing a large upswing in the economy and China, of course, was a big driver for that. <coughs> yeah, and um, now we're basically talking a little bit about the uh, development of logistics and, uh, and also current trends and what's happening and uh, we want to compare that to a couple of other industries. Here, for example, you see how the uh, spend for advertising developed over the last 50, 60 years in the US yeah, on a steady increase until 70 billion, uh, and then since 2000 on a steep curve down. And um, who's taking that over? Um, uh, two companies you know very well, and they're not just taking over the money that has been spent, but they're extending it heavily. Um, uh, to be fair, this is global revenue, and that was only US. Uh, but it's still, um, I think, the curves alone uh, show it in a very good way. Uh, second huge industry, finance. Um, banking, yeah? One of the very conservative um, uh, industries in um, a, a bit later, like five, six years later than the advertisement uh, space, uh, the peak with around 95,000 branches of, of banks, and since then also going continuously down, and uh, at the same time, we see that the fintech space uh, picked up some 12, 15 years ago. Uh, N26, for example, one of the famous players out of Berlin. Uh, uh, Valentin is also going to present here or, or present it today, I think. Um, and the tech, uh, the fintech companies grew to more than 12,000 and banking became uh, or is possible now to handle it completely in a digital way. And um, this shows basically the log tech um, uh, development. Uh, this is the uh, amount of venture capital that flew into log tech worldwide, into any kind of model, not just into digital freight forwarding, also into marketplaces, price comparison, and so on. 
And the interesting thing is that from 2012 to 16, so uh, in a matter of only four to five years, this grew by 18x and um, is by now uh, more than 10 billion. So it's something that's really picking up uh, at the moment. And that shows us also that uh, logistics is the next industry that is to be disrupted from digital players. And that's going through a big, uh, big change uh, right now. And we see those changes on multiple levels. Yeah, maybe autonomous vehicles, maybe robotics and automation, augmented reality that will ha help uh, warehousing uh, workers in the future, and drones um, that will significantly change the way we receive our goods in the future. Last mile delivery, um, anticipatory logistics. So um, how machine learning and AI will will enable um, um, yeah companies to source and, and and order better and sooner. And machine learning, um, Internet of Things, and then pretty much warehousing and freight form, which we see kind of like the center of, uh, of all of those trends, because in the end, as a, as a business, you want to have a very simple um, uh, simple involvement, simple engagement with those players, and usually freight forwarding company is the single point of contact to a lot of those uh, other uh, verticals. Yeah. Let's start with autonomous vehicles. I mean, uh, most of you will probably know Auto. Yeah, um, the first company who's really been tapping into the space when it comes to the freight area. Uh, they've been bought by by Uber uh, a couple of years back, and we see today in Germany, especially, why this trend will be so utmost important in the in the future because there's just a big lack of drivers. So already today, we see a huge oversupply, uh, over over demand versus the supply that we have and the capacity that is being uh, that is being available there. Next, warehousing. Yeah, I mean, if you look at companies like Zalando or Amazon, uh, yeah, they have a lot of their workforce uh, worldwide is being uh, uh, is being active in the warehousing space, and there will just uh, there will just be a lot more technology that that will change the landscape there, increase efficiency by more than 20x, and Grabit is a is a really good example there, building um, automatic uh, stacking, automating uh, picking robotics uh, that are being active there. Okulavis, also a German company, actually, out of Aachen. Let's say not the most vivid tec uh, technology hub in Germany when it comes to startup, but very heavy on the engineering side. They've pretty much built an industrial Google Class, which helps uh, warehousing, uh, warehousing employees to pick and sort better and faster. <coughs> Skycard, drone startup out of, uh, out of San Jose, US. They actually do the first deliveries already today in Switzerland, um, bringing goods to customers 24-7. Um, uh, more efficiently and uh, on, on a large scale, um, pretty much seven days a week. They live um, bringing um, uh, multiple career services online, yeah, not just uh, donkeys here, like in this example, but also um, trucks and, 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 and smaller businesses uh, in already 35 states today in the US, pretty much being the Uber for last mile delivery, similar to, to Shutterfox in India, for example, bringing um, all the small career services that you see today online and uh, in the digital space. Clear Metal, um, player out of uh, San Francisco, basically sourcing different kinds of data and increasing the, the quality of ETA prediction for, uh, uh, for the supply chain for shipping companies. Um, and I mean, we are active in this space, we know how messy this data can be thereby significantly improving the, 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 the way that customers today uh, plan and, and uh, plan the supply chain. Sentinel, a machine learning company, an algorithm that is uh, also sourcing tons of data from, from IoT devices. And basically what they can do is they already check today on an uh, automatic level if drivers keep their, um, their downtimes, yeah? if they drive too fast, if they drive fuel efficient or not. So um, being active on a very operative side of, uh, of the business, but helping companies to, to, to work and, and run more effectively. CargoSense um, uh, developing IoT devices, um, uh, low energy that you can put in a container. Um, we as a freight forwarding com company live off by this data that we can provide then to customers out of the automotive space, for example, because those customers are interested if the container was on its way um, that often takes 30 to 40 days um, and perceived uh, some kind of shocks, some kind of big temperature swings and thereby uh, big hum uh, humidity changes um, because sometimes you then have a shipment uh, that arrives at your destination or at your warehouse 35 to 40, sometimes 45 days later and you see um, the goods went bad, the goods were damaged and so on and so forth and you want to see this as soon as possible to reorder and source earlier so you don't run into, uh, into downturns. 
And last but not least, the warehousing and freight forwarding area. And this is where Freight Hub is tapping in with the big goal to build a digital backbone for a lot of those trends, yeah, uh, being the, the center of gravity for the supply chain operations of our customers. And I think in the end it's, um, yeah, you've seen a lot of different, uh, different spaces now. Um, and I think it's always important to ask if it's a feature or if it's actually a full product. And um, uh, most of those things we've just seen are things that we can somehow implement in the value chain that we are delivering to the customers. It's parts of it, small parts, but we're basically delivering an end-to-end -end service, moving containers, pallets uh, from warehouse to, um, uh, to final destination for our customers. Um, looking briefly at the, um, uh, at or how and what we're basically doing. Yeah? So you have a, a shipper. Uh, for example, Home24 wants to import 10 containers uh, full of furniture from Shanghai into their warehouse in Erfurt. And um, there are a lot of different steps in between that they need to conduct in order to get the goods there. And in between is the layer, the freight forwarder, which is a freight hub, uh, functioning in a fully digital uh, manner. And it basically starts with the trucking from the origin, the export authorities. Then you have the so-called main run, which is uh, often via ocean sometimes also via air or via the new Silk Road, um, uh, via rail. Um, you have to do customs at the uh, port of discharge and uh, obviously do trucking again to the, uh, to the final destination. Can also be barge, even though at the moment in Germany barge is not working, uh, it's too dry, uh, the ships can't, uh, uh, can't move on the Rhine River, uh, which causes huge problems and a lot of delays because 40% of the volume that's arriving is usually being transported the last mile via barge. No barge, big problem um, uh, for the trucks and the capacity. So um, just that's basically what, uh, what we are doing as a full service um, a freight forwarder. And um, if you look at the, uh, at the history, we founded the company in early 2016. Um, uh, four co-founders, three operational co-founders and uh, started in Berlin got our first uh, seed financing in, in September, three million from uh, mostly German uh, VCs and also a couple of um, uh, business angels from the uh, shipping industry. Amongst them, for example, um, Ottmar Gast, who's the former CEO of Hamburg Süd, uh, one of the uh, biggest ocean carriers in the world and now acquired by Maersk. And um, uh, started building freight forwarding uh, in the beginning with smaller customers and, uh, and a couple of features and by now extended it a lot um, got our own NVOCC license, um, uh, also in the process of getting an IATA license for, um, uh, for moving or for basically booking our own air cargo with, with airlines directly. Kept growing the team, acquired more customers, closed the 20 million uh, Series A end of last year, uh, the biggest Series A uh, in the log tech space in Europe so far, and uh, are today around 130 people in four different offices, headquarters still in Berlin. Um, I have a second office in Hamburg, close basically to the center of gravity from a logistic, uh, logistical um, uh, perspective. Have another office in Cologne and just opened up our first international office uh, in Hong Kong, moving closer to the partners we work with um, uh, there and obviously also the suppliers of uh, most of our customers. Yeah. And um, <coughs> so far acquired uh, more than a thousand uh, business customers in a bit more than two years um, uh, that we are active. And at the bottom you can see a couple of logos of the customers we work with. So we're not just servicing e-commerce customers uh, from our network, but actually um, also really well established, uh, big German uh, multi-billion uh, dollar family businesses like Fiesmann, Miele and so on. If you then look at the way that incumbents, um, so the established players are handling freight, it's a completely broken process. Um, starting from the um, uh, quotation, so basically the question where and how do I get a price if I want to move 10 containers, that is the first step in the, in the chain that is uh, pretty broken and that takes up to a couple of days and um, uh, usually you're receiving it via an email, PDF attachment, uh, two to three pages, um, uh, just nothing that is uh, anywhere close where it should be um, uh, looking uh, in, uh, or being in the 21st century. And communication is still a lot via phone, a lot via email. Uh, there's no transparency where the shipment is. It's um, when we started looking into that, 
um, late 2015, early 2016, um, it was really mind-boggling uh, uh, for us how the, this huge industry is functioning at the moment. Yeah? And um, in essence, we are basically um, lifting the freight forwarding industry into the 21st century through our digital platform. In the beginning, we we're able to um, provide real-time quotes. So with us, you type in five containers, uh, Shanghai to Erfurt into your warehouse, and within a couple of seconds, you have a couple of hundred options you can choose from and you can book immediately. Um, we also build a state-of-the-art track and trace, so the customer can on our platform see at any point of time where the container, where his goods are located, if there is a delay because there's a typhoon in front of uh, Shanghai, um, or, or whatever it might be, there are a lot of obstacles on this 18,000 kilometer long way um, uh, to the final destination. And uh, also the topic of supply chain analytics. So we're giving our customers the insight and make all data that we're gathering available for him and reports that he can create himself and create better insights and um, basically um, gain control over his supply chain again. And uh, last but not least, we're making also the whole process much more efficient for the customer, but also internally. We developed our own uh, transport management system and um, made therefore the flow, um, how our also our internal processes are working, um, uh, basically twice as efficient as it is with the existing players, knowing that because we hired a lot of talent from the big forwarding companies, obviously, because the knowledge is valuable, but we're doing it just in a, yeah, in a little bit of a different way. And um, looking at the market overall, it's a super fragmented market. You have a couple of large players, uh, Kuhn and Nagel, for example, being the biggest ocean freight forwarder, moving three and a half million containers per year, um, generating some 20 billion uh, in revenue, yet still having a very small um, uh, portion of the, uh, of the overall cake. Yeah? Uh, the 10 largest um, uh, guys, just roughly 10% market share, 130, more than 130 million containers being moved um, uh, year by year. Yeah. And in the air freight, it's a bit more consolidated, but still tens of thousands of players. So that allows us an easy entry uh, into that market. And there's also even um, a potential room for consolidation. <coughs> and now basically um, a little bit of insights from the real freight forwarding world. Um, uh, this is uh, basically one of the largest um, uh, air carriers or, or, or master loaders in, in Asia. Um, who is basically consolidating a lot of goods and um, uh, moving it then with Lufthansa Cargo and so on. And a couple of things that are interesting. First of all, he's been moving so many goods that um, a couple of planes are now named after him. Yeah? But at the same time, that guy does not have a computer. Yeah? <laughs> and um, if, you, if you keep looking a little bit further into the office, um, you see there's just a ton of paper. Yeah? When customers or other partners are visiting us and coming into our office, they're like, where are all the documents? Where, where is everything? Yeah? It's really, you can't imagine. I mean, if, you, if you're here at NOAA, you can't imagine anyways because you're digital and, 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 and progressive. But if you go into these offices and see how they're working, the people, they have a desk and they have a pile of paper here this high and a pile of paper that, uh, that high on the other side. Yeah? So it's... Um, uh, it's really a, a market and an industry that has to be disrupted now, and there's a, a ton of potential here. And um, now uh, a quick uh, video basically giving you some insights of the uh, platform and how we are uh, basically doing uh, a freight forwarding uh, today, um, and how we're also in the end making it a bit more exciting uh, again. Yeah. And I'll just let you, uh, let you mostly enjoy this. Uh, give you a couple of comments. So first of all, this is basically how you now place shipments, how you get quotes, you put in the origin, the destination, define how many containers, if you want customs or also insurance, and you get prices right away. Many options, you can choose whatever suits you best in terms of arrival date. You see full transparency, all prices, uh, put in a couple of more data uh, points, and you book the shipment. That's basically how fast it goes today. Um, at the same time here, we also enabled the suppliers of our customers to book shipments via our platform, taking workload away from our customers, making it easier for them because the supplier in the end knows when the cargo is ready. 
and uh, is actually the best guy to, uh, to place the bookment. And um, the, our customer can then basically reject or just approve um, uh, the booking um, as another feature that increases the efficiency for our, uh, for our customers. Um, <coughs> in terms of um, uh, reliability, um, we, we're basically getting um, all data in real time if there's a delay or if anything is happening on the way and we can uh, act up on it um, at, at that very moment. Yeah? Not just when the shipment um, uh, is too late, but we're noticing it much earlier. And here you can also build, for example, um, reports and create your own shipment overview, um, customize it however you, um, uh, you want it, and um, also use the activity feed in order to communicate uh, and exchange information um, regarding every individual shipment, which helps, obviously, if someone is, um, is out of office and another person is taking over. Also, the document management. Um, in the normal way, you're searching in your inbox uh, to find stuff. Here, everything is in one place. Uh, you can't lose it and, um, and have it always at hand. Here, a couple of reporting functions. Yeah, you can, for example, say, I want a recurring report. I want to know every Monday morning at 8 a.m. what containers are going to arrive at the warehouse um, uh, this week, for example. And um, those are just a, a couple of features that we've been building over the past, uh, over the past two years, winning more than 1,000 customers so far, um, obviously accelerating this, uh, this speed of growth and the speed of, uh, of development. And um, uh, this remains a super interesting um, uh, industry, and I think there's a lot of change going to happen over the next um, uh, two to five years. Yeah, thanks a lot for your uh, for your attention. Uh, we can now basically open up uh, the round if there are any uh, any questions, comments, uh, remarks uh, that uh, you would like to state. But thanks for your uh, for your attention first of all. disrupting the logistic uh, and there are your customers are classic so to say how easy is for them because I know the German uh, I live in, Ger uh, in Hamburg and uh, the Spedition uh, the German uh, people in this branch are not very uh, digital and uh, how, how you approach to them yeah. So the question was basically how easy it is. I just repeat the question so that everyone can hear it. Um, how easy it is to acquire customers, especially when they're like fairly traditional. And um, uh, the answer is uh, yes, it's not always easy. Um, uh, especially maybe if the um, guy who's in charge of the logistics is already in his uh, early 60s, then he's maybe not up for change and will just wait until his retirement. But what we see is, uh, first of all, that people that are handling all their private manners and their private business, you know, ordering a cab via Uber, um, uh, ordering all their stuff via Amazon, they're not really willing to have their, uh, their private life completely digital and then moving to their business life and being stuck in the 90s. Yeah? So this development towards using technology also at your workplace is pushing more and more towards digitalization and also making people more and more open for our uh, solution here. And... Um, uh, you also need to differentiate between different customer segments. So we have some smaller customers that are shipping goods directly to the Amazon warehouses, so-called FBA sellers. They're using fulfillment by Amazon. They are, of course, super thankful that they don't need to interact in a manual way uh, anymore and, and calling guys, but that they can actually now book their shipments importing 10,000 iPhone cases uh, at 11 p.m. at night uh, in a seamless way. Yeah? And um, in the beginning, it has been hard. By now, we already generated quite some good brands and, and large comp larger companies that are working together with us. We're using them as references. We're using our investors network. And we are also doing on-site visits um, uh, at the larger customers, um, explaining, showing the, the platform. And you also do need to allow a bit more time. So sales cycles uh, can be a bit longer. But um, I would say almost no one is neglecting that digitalization is going to happen and, uh, uh, and uh, that this is the future in the end. But for some people, it'll take a bit longer and for others, uh, it'll work out faster. Any further questions? Yeah. 
Hi, my name is Ingo Potov. I work for a VC firm, UVC Partners. Um, I follow your development with interest, and we also have looking at other, let's say, uh, new companies, digital freight forwarders. Um, so this is the VC view. The question I have, um, I like your space, but the question I have is, um, aren't there players out, software companies out there, instead of building a digital freight forwarder, who may digitize the thousands of existing freight forwarders? Why is there no, not enough, apparently, software technology to help the whole industry? Um, uh, for you, good, you get an opportunity, apparently, but um, isn't there a software uh, landscape developing? Um, yeah, maybe I, uh, I start yeah. with this, but you can add on, uh, add Barry. On. Um, I mean, there's uh, multiple reasons why I this won't work. Yeah, we have, of course, looked at the very beginning at, at the space carefully. Um, uh, the three main reasons are that from a very beginning, um, today if you have a traditional, or let's say a forward-thinking customer going to a um, conventional freight forwarder yeah, who has, let's say, a digital quoting interface, um, the, the, the level of service you will receive will not be that much different. They have done the processes for many years for the, for the, very, same, uh, for, uh, the, the very same way, and just putting a digital lipstick on it won't help. Yeah? So there's many marketplace models out there that have tried to do so, but in the end, the way they handle the goods and the way they process the shipments will remain the same. Yeah? So we've been in the beginning deciding to go a vertically integrated approach so we can directly integrate partners that we work with, get beta better, get better uh, data quality uh, from them, and also educate our operations people to um, process the shipments in a way that we have a very low data latency on our platform. Yeah? Because there's many, there's many different forwarders that have some kind of digital interface as well, but the main reason that, uh, that is um, basically preventing their success is that uh, they do have a shitty data quality. Yeah? They have uh, shared service centers in Romania who is typing then in uh, gate in, gate out data in, in Mexico, and the entire DNA of the company is just not um, heading in a way where you will really improve the, the user experience uh, uh, by a certain level. Yeah? Um, second reason is operational efficiency. Yeah? And next to the, the way customer receives the entire booking experience, um, there is no differentiation uh, between the different forwarders yeah? uh, if they all use the same software. Yeah? And none of the existing softwares is really um, ramping up efficiency uh, by, by a certain percentage that you, that you would see really a, a certain um, um, su superiority in, in, in terms of efficiency. Yeah? So we basically built a, a transport management system, sort of backbone of our operations, that is seamlessly integrated to the front end, yeah? and it's working hand in hand. So every information that we show is being, uh, is being guided for, for the operations people to be typed in on time, and we can control them tightly so the service level and the data quality on the platform is, is, is high and, and, and uh, the steps can be automated um, uh, step by step. Yeah? And the third and, and, and probably most important factor is that the way the customers are being serviced at the very moment yeah, is just um, based on a lot of personal relationship phone calls, WhatsApp, WeChat, and, and so on and so forth. And the DNAs of the uh, DNA of the freight forwarding companies are, is, is purely directed in, in, in this way. Yeah? And I think that in order to really perform a radical transformation in such an industry, like you need to have a different culture in the company. And I think that is a really massive, uh, massive advantage that we have over a lot of the incumbents, that we have just a lot of young people that are uh, very engaged and that know how to handle digital uh, interfaces. And then in the end, it doesn't really matter so much if they have 20 years of logistics experience or two years of logistics experience, if they, can, uh, if they, if they have a tool that is just guiding them through a process a lot better and a lot faster. Uh, maybe just adding one, one um, uh <laughs> little thing on top of this. So I mean, there have been, I mean, Kuhn and Nagel, DHL Global Forwarding, all of them are trying to build digital platforms. Yeah? And uh, a very famous example, DHL, um, a new forwarding environment, uh, tried to digitize and streamline all their processes worldwide. Um, invested some 800 million and completely failed and rolled back. Killed the whole project completely, 800 million gone. And why is that? Because the complexity of their business is almost not, uh, it's almost not possible to handle it. Uh, they had a ton of unorganic growth, uh, it's worldwide, it was just, they just didn't manage. That information came out late 2015 
right when we were in the ideation phase for Freight Hub. And that was another piece of information that gave us the confidence, hey, uh, even the biggest guys with billions of, of budget cannot really do this. So that's great. They're no threat for us. So we can go and build it basically green on a green field approach, bottom up from the very beginning in the right way. Yeah? For the large guys, it's ex to do this transition is extremely difficult because um, they have, they're working with such bad legacy systems. The whole organization, the people, everything is really legacy. And there are a few companies like Freight OS, for example, that are trying to build um, uh, systems that can be used by existing forwarders, but it's only moving them forward 5%, 10%. But they need to move forward 200%. And it's, it's going to be really difficult for them. Just a short question, Frederick Severin, Andres <laughs> Sayagang. Um, how is your price point compared to organize it yourself? If you have like big co companies uh, booking the trips on you, and um, are there like similar models around worldwide, probably in the U.S.? And so, regarding price point, if you say, um, what is it like if you take out the forwarder and just organize it yourself with the the complexity of that is extremely difficult. So that's why freight forwarding basically exists because companies even that move a couple of thousand containers it's too complex for them and uh, too much hassle um, uh, to be in contact with every single service provider and, and, and bundle that themselves so uh, if it gets really large if you move uh, 30 50,000 100,000 containers those guys are directly interacting with ocean carriers and so on but for the smaller ones it's just not feasible it's as if you would say uh, I don't buy the car from BMW I'm gonna build it myself um, and, um, and in terms of price point, it is a, a question of scale also. So the bigger you are, the better prices you get from the ocean carriers. We started very small with nothing. <laughs> um, um, used network and, and also selling a bit of vision. And now we're growing quickly. And this growth enables us to get better prices than we would actually deserve looking at our volume that we're moving. Uh, we're still not moving a, an enormous amount of containers. Um, uh, but but we're growing, and there are not many forwarders that are really growing quickly. So uh, customer or ocean carriers actually like us. Um, um, yeah. So that basically in terms of in terms of price comparison and in terms of like competition, are there other people doing that? Um, in Europe, we're the only digital like pure play um, uh, freight forwarder that exists. Um, uh, there is uh, basically one other um, uh, company that's also doing full service freight forwarding in the U.S. Uh, uh, in the West Coast, um, a flex port, um, and there is also um, a couple of players in Asia, but it's not many because the complexity is very high, uh, the entry barrier for ocean and air uh, forwarding is pretty high, and, um <coughs> and by now we also reached in Europe a certain scale uh, so that I do not think that there will be a lot of uh, fast followers or anything like that. Um, but also, to add, um, uh, this is not a winner-takes-it-all market. Uh, uh, this is not um, a Facebook against StudiVZ or anything like that. Um, uh, it's always going to stay a fragmented market. Um, there will be consolidation, um, but um, larger forwarders are not placing all eggs into one basket. So, uh, sorry, larger shippers. Yeah. So people that move a couple of thousand containers don't do it just with one. They do it with two or maybe three. Yeah. Okay, any other questions? I don't know how much. Uh, maybe one more. Yeah. Do you offer a price advantage to your customers? Um, so we are not cheaper than other freight forwarders, I would say. It's like our value proposition is not price, having the cheapest price. Also, because due to our volume, which I just explained, we don't get the best procurement rates um, uh, in the market. Yeah. So for us, it's having a competitive price but then adding additional value through the platform, through the efficiency. And if you would take it all into account and basically also take into account the um, time that is saved by the people that are handling the logistics process at the customer, then we would be overall cheaper, but that is, it's not super easy to quantify because cases are a bit differently. But um, if, you, if you make it a holistic calculation, we would be cheaper because we're more because our, our way of doing it is more efficient. But in terms of pure price, uh, we are just at par.
and it's also not our, like, we rather want to charge a couple of percentage points more, but uh, the overall market is very price sensitive um, still at the moment. Okay. Yeah, well, thanks a lot. <laughs> <laughs>